Houston is tested again, LA has a breakout week, and the New York Guardians continue to humble me. These are the week three XFL power rankings. Jumping right into it this week is the ultimate fall from grace. I know, let's get all the laughs out now, yes. I had the New York Guardians number one in my week one power rankings, but enough dwelling on that. Once again, the Guardians struggled, to put it mildly. Their quarterback play was suspect at best. The running backs were once again balanced but not dangerous, and their defense were basically bystanders, watching one of the best QBs in the league go to work. The Guardians just aren't good enough to compete at the level they're playing at, and frankly, only in week one did they show anything close to an ability to beat good teams in the XFL. Without better play calling, a dramatic increase in quarterback ability, and a more focused defense, I'm afraid the Guardians may be stuck at number eight for a while. It pains me to put the Dragons down at number seven because I see how they can be a great team. But unlike several other teams where the talent is there and it's the coaching staff that is working to put the players in the best position, I like the Dragons' approach to games from a coaching perspective. It's the actual players on the field that are holding them back. Quarterback Brandon Silvers went 21 of 34 for 204 yards and two TDs plus a pick, and I feel like that's about as good as he's gonna get, at least going by what we've seen from him. Once again, their rushing attack is balanced but not special, and it wasn't good enough against the Renegades. The bright spot is really their defense, which did a good job for three plus quarters. They're not particularly adept at rushing the quarterback, but they're good run stoppers and they force turnovers. Unfortunately, we've seen three games now, and so I really can't judge teams by what they could show me. I have to go by what they do show me. And speaking of teams that did show me something, the Vipers clock in at number six. It's a party in Tampa Bay, the future home of WrestleMania in April, bore witness to an absolute slobber knocker of a game last Saturday. I'll show myself out now. But what we saw from the Vipers was a truly fantastic performance from a team that showed very few bright spots early on. They may really be onto something with Quinton Flowers. Even though he only threw six passes, his 80 combined yards from scrimmage and a touchdown provided the exact spark the Vipers had been missing. Last week, I criticized their big play ability, and even though they didn't bust out the giant chunk yardage plays, their use of gadget plays and just general versatility was far more than they showed their first two games. They were also really great in the extra point game, so much better than they were, in fact, that I'm convinced being good in the extra point game correlates to more success. I'm actually planning on a video discussing that very concept near the end of the season. For now, though, the Vipers are still a winless team. But being as good as they were against last week's number one team shows me enough to say they're good enough to beat the Dragons and Guardians, who they play again in week 10. Coming in at number five, we've got the Dallas Renegades. Now, it, it's tough to put a two-win team this low, especially a two-win team whose only loss came in a game without their starting quarterback. But this is evidence of how little I trust Landry Jones given what we've seen. The Renegades have put all their eggs in that basket, with Jones throwing 40 passes in Week 2 and 41 in Week 3. The problem is, he's not good enough to be given that kind of trust. He's thrown more passes than any quarterback in those two weeks, and he's completed 72% of them, to be fair. But he's thrown four picks to just four touchdowns, three of those touchdowns coming against a weak Dragons pass defense, and his QBR of 87.4 in those two games is average. And the problem is, with Jones taking up so many plays with his average passing, it leaves less room for the variety you need to be successful. Cameron Artis Payne is a good back, and he showed it with 80 yards against the Dragons, but he did that on just 13 attempts. He had 14 in their game against the Wildcats. So we've learned two things. Dallas is one-dimensional, and they're very consistent. But for now, I can't bring myself to put them any higher than number five without seeing more from Landry Jones. Number four is a team that's basically in the same situation as Dallas, a quarterback I don't trust at all and too much built around it. Yes, it's the DC Defenders, a team that was utterly exposed by the LA Wildcats. It was the biggest win in XFL history. Can we say that? Does the first iteration count? You know what I mean. The Wildcats starched DC last Sunday. And DC has all the same flaws I just pointed out with the Renegades. But they land a spot higher because, and this will probably make some of you angry, flukes can happen. 
Yes, after three games, I'm still confident in saying the defenders are a top four team in the XFL, even after that performance. Even though I trust Cardell Jones less than I trust Landry Jones, and he threw four picks against an LA defense that struggled to cause turnovers in their first two games, I still like DC as a team slightly more than I like Dallas. Their rushing attack is far more balanced. They had four guys with more than five rushing attempts. They're more diverse at receiver and tight end, and their defense is better at rushing the quarterback. 39 point travesty notwithstanding. No, that game last week said more to me about the Wildcats than it did about the defenders, and even though we have only three games to go off of, I'm confident saying the defenders are better than that performance would suggest. With all that being said, number three still has to be the aforementioned LA Wildcats. Yes, it was a fluke performance as far as the defenders were concerned, but I saw a lot more from the Wildcats that I think has staying power. First and foremost, Josh Johnson. He built on a solid performance in week two with a stellar and efficient performance in week three. He goes 18 of 25 for 278 yards and three touchdowns. Once again, LA doesn't really run the ball, but then again, the top rusher in the XFL through three games has 224 total yards, so this isn't really a rushing league. The Wildcats look fantastic. They rushed the quarterback and forced five turnovers. They were efficient and protected the ball. It's just one game, which prevents me from putting them any higher, but if that Josh Johnson and that Wildcats team shows up every week, we may have a new contender for the XFL Championship. For now though, we have to stick with our more consistent teams at the top, and staying at number two is the St. Louis Battlehawks. Once again, the margin between them and the Roughnecks is thinner than a Jewish supermodel after Yom Kippur. And even though the Roughnecks were pushed to the limit by the team that was in the basement of these rankings for two weeks, the Battlehawks didn't put in a performance for me to definitively say they're better than the team they lost to in week two. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying the Battlehawks can't move up into that number one spot, but in their dominating victory over the Guardians, they just kind of looked like they were going through the motions. There's nothing wrong with that. Jordan Tamu had a solid, albeit unremarkable game, going 12 of 18 for a buck 19. The Battlehawks did their Battlehawks thing. They chewed up clock on the ground, rushing for 156 yards as a team with two touchdowns. They absolutely choked the life out of the Guardians on defense, relentlessly pursuing the quarterback and really any other person with a pulse in the backfield. There's an argument to be made that the Battlehawks have the most complete defense in the XFL from D-line to secondary. It was an unremarkable showing from St. Louis, but that should be just as scary as Jordan Ta'amu's more jaw-dropping performances. Remember, we're three weeks into the XFL. Teams are not supposed to have gelled to the point where they can just put the clamps on and go through the motions. This is as complete a team as there is in the XFL from top to bottom, offense, defense, and special teams, and they can beat you in all different ways. But for the second week in a row, it's the Houston Roughnecks that take the top spot. Can we come up with a new term like the opposite of the wooden spoon? The platinum knife? Boom! Right, I'll work on that. But going down to the wire against the Vipers shouldn't distract anyone from the fact the Roughnecks are still a terrific team. They don't have quite the balance the Battlehawks do, but they do have explosiveness and a big playability. Sometimes that can come back to bite you as the Roughnecks just couldn't convert in short yardage situations for most of the game against the Vipers. But don't let the margin of victory fool you, which is the same thing I say when I got out a 1-0 extra time win in FIFA. The Roughnecks were as good as ever against the Vipers. P.J. Walker went 24 of 36 for 306 yards and 3 TDs, adding 34 yards and a score on the ground. Cam Phillips was money again, catching 8 balls on 10 targets for 194 yards and 3 touchdowns. They didn't turn the ball over, and they were excellent on extra points. In many ways, this was maybe the best performance of the year for the Roughnecks. It was just offset by the best performance of the year from the Vipers. But at the end of the day, we're left with a Roughnecks team that looks as dangerous as ever, and P.J. Walker, who's looking like the early runaway favorite for league MVP. And next week, the Roughnecks will really be able to consolidate if they earn a win over the Renegades at home. Next week is their chance to keep the all-important number one ranking in my XFL power rankings, which we all know is of the utmost importance to every player in the league. So as always, if you disagree with any of my rankings, please let me know in the comments down below. Let's have a conversation. Subscribe to GA Sports for all our content now, 
and in the future, we appreciate you.